getting started and wanting to learn and talk to me more on the advanced traffic working things, uh, Canvas, let me all know. Being is really interesting and kind of pushing the edge. So hopefully it's inclusive for everybody that wants to come. The next month will be at the Pearson Space in San Diego, where Mike Greenberg will be talking about Node, or more advanced Node, and I'll be giving an introduction to that guys. So that's uh, about it. Okay. 
Yeah, I maintain the Ruby driver, so if you have complaints about that, let me know. And uh, I maintain the C driver as well. Let me see programmers here. Um, and then I, you know, if you don't maintain the node driver, I'm sorry. I apologize for not being a node person per se. I do have some JavaScript though. Um, I'm not going to be showing you today, so um, we'll do all the demos of that. Uh, and then another question I have is how many people here actually know something about MongoDB? Like, can you can use it or. Okay, cool. Um, so I don't know. I think mean, I could do a formal presentation on something, but I'd much rather just talk to you guys and have a conversation. And, um, you know, pick your brain, let you pick my brain. Oh, formal presentation. Are you serious? <laughs> okay. Yeah. You're really bored. Right? And I do have some slides I can use. Um, <laughs> but um, before I actually like default to that, um, is there like somebody who has a question or you know something that I can just talk about or that we can talk about? I mean, maybe if you hate Mongo, tell me why it sucks, and we can talk about that. You know, any of those things. Um, so how about you go back? What you Where did you get that name? Mongo. Oh, where did you get the name? Um, I'll be honest with you. It, I did not name it. One, and the other thing is that it was actually it was actually just a name that sounded like it might work. Okay, but it actually turned out that Mongo is not a very good word in most European languages. Does anybody even know that? Um, it actually you know means like it's a very derogatory word for somebody who's sort of mentally insane. Okay, so if you call somebody Mongo. Um, yeah, so it was, actually, it was actually pretty offensive to a lot of people users of course, but I think, you know, the way we look at it is we're actually, you know, dignifying that term, you know, we're not like, you know, <laughs> we're giving a term to completely new meaning and maybe, you know, it'll help, you know, people like to talk about it. Any other questions? Any other, any other thoughts or questions? Yeah. Uh, the thing that always was uh, my brain with any NoSQL system is, um, how to untwist my relational thinking brain yeah. into this new thing. Because there's times when I'm like, I know I've got users here, but I know I want this to have users, are they in here? And just yeah. that whole paradigm shift. Yeah, how many people have had that same thought? Have the same thoughts, actually. Raise your hand with pride. All right, yeah, a few people. So um, that's a really, really good question. It's actually one of the first questions that I last my mind. And one of the things you, you notice, you see that document idea, the idea of this JSON structure where there's kind of richness, right? Um, where you might have like a, a user document and then all their photos are like in there also, or right? all the metadata about their photos are actually in that document also. And uh, that's that's a thing you can do in Mongo, and you, know, you can definitely query the document in that way. But there are actually a lot of disadvantages to just like massive denormalization, right? And so what you actually want to do in your, in your schema designing in Mongo is you actually want to start with what you would consider a normalized quasi-relational model, right? You want to actually start thinking that way. And then you look at that model and you say, okay, which of these things go together naturally, right? So let me give you an example. Um, let's say you're going to build an e-commerce site. How many people here have like built e-commerce e things? Right? I think a lot of people have, right? So you've seen how how products end up um, being built out in a relational way, right? How do you do it? How many tables do you have? You might have six or seven or eight, or nine or ten, or three, depending on how you do this, right? But you know, at least you're going to have a table for the prices, the pricing history, right? And you might have a table for the manufacturers, right? And you might have a table for the tags associated with that product. You might have a separate table or even a series of tables for those attributes which belong to a product, belong to that thing, which are dynamic. Have you ever tried doing dynamic attributes in a relational database? Like, you know, these products can have, I don't know what kind of attributes they're going to have in advance, but I have to find a way to model this. So how do you go about doing Okay, yeah, you can take like a serialized comment, yeah, or a column and deserialize it. That's one way to do it. I've seen it done in another way. Sorry? Uh, table with two fields and three fields. I think they can value. Yeah, so yeah, I need a value field, right? You can get even crazier, though, right? Like, what were you going to say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Right, each of which has like they all have the same fields except for like some some type and its value, right? And you associate that like in this really crazy way. 
right? And then you get this huge, massive joy, right? So there are different reasons why you, what you, what you realize is that there are actually different reasons why you end up doing joy in most relational data models. So one reason is to put together some kind of thing that becomes this object on the application side. So a product might have its pricing, its pricing history, its dynamic attributes, its, um, you know, it's shipping policies, like all these different things, right? These might all be in different tables, and you join them together so that you can display this thing, right? But that's the only kind of join you ever really do on that, right? And so therefore, all you're doing is you're denormalizing, but you're putting it back together just for the sake of like, I don't know, because you have to normalize it, you know, as in traditional database, right? But you have to normalize it. You know, you put everything back together, you know, and you get this object. Well, that may not be the best use of join, right? And so, if you if, if the JSON object like you know rich representation of the thing is uh, you know sufficient to represent the object, if you don't need to use the little parts in too many other places, then it might actually make sense to have this more object like representation, right? So that's a really good reason to just have a JSON structure instead, right? But then there are other kinds of joins where you're doing like analytics across like you know some type of graph inside your relational database, and that maybe is a little bit harder to do. Right, so you know, does that answer your question? Yeah, because that's where you, now your head's on it. Okay, yeah. With the here's the relational database is really well. We're trying to aggregate the data. Here's right the books and their genres. Here's how many books are written in each genre. Right. It's easy to aggregate. Right. Yeah. It is easy. Yeah. Yeah. Is that just going to be the pain? Aggregate Mongo is the question. No, just the yeah. um. Does that paradigm still work? Um, to some extent, but if you have to do like a lot of self join, if you have to do joins through five tables, that's going to be really hard, right? Because you can't do a join in Mongo, and therefore you're going to have to kind of pull it all back on the application side and you know knit together. So that might that might not really be the ideal situation, um, unless you can find a way to kind of denormalize and represent as an object like thing, right? But the other advantage of representing something as like a, a single holistic object is that you get locality. Right? Because if I have to join across all these different elements on disk and memory, that's actually, a, it's, it's computationally expensive on the server side. And it's also potentially just expensive because I have to go to so many different locations, possibly hitting disk in various locations. Whereas if I have a single holistic representation of something, right, then I can just go to that one place and grab it. Right? That's a single query. Right? There's nothing computationally expensive server side, and it's all one place. So that actually is a benefit if you can find a way you know, to monitor data. So does everyone know kind of the problem with the current aggregation model in Mongo? Okay, so I'll do my best to explain it. So right now, if you do this thing called MapReduce, have you heard this really annoying thing called MapReduce? MapReduce is really confusing because there are a lot of databases that have a thing called MapReduce, but it means something different in every database. Um, it kind of means the same thing on a like really fundamental basic level, but what you actually use it for and how you actually do it is totally different. So Hadoop, right? Hadoop is like the ultimate MapReduce engine. That's why you run Hadoop so that you can do massive kind of distributed aggregation across the machine, right? We intentionally do that. Uh, and CouchDB, MapReduce is this way of building indexes, right? So you, you build these views that are based upon MapReduce, and it's, it's how you build a feed tree index in CouchDB. Then in MongoDB, MapReduce is how you do ad hoc aggregation. Uh, but there are a couple of problems with that. Okay. One of the things is that you have to write JavaScript. That's supposed to be a joke. <laughs> no. But um, yeah, you have to write JavaScript. And um, it's actually hard for a lot of people to write JavaScript. You know, I know it's not hard for you guys, but if somebody says, I'm programming in Java, you know, I'm programming in C sharp, why do I have to write JavaScript? You know, they don't actually want to have to do that. Um, and it's actually a little bit complicated to write a reducer. You know, to, to get your idea about around what reducing actually means, you know, like the idea that reduce function can run more than once over the same piece of data, so you have to keep that in mind when you're running the reduce function. It's actually a little bit annoying, right? And the second problem with the current implementation is that, is JavaScript, sorry. Um, but uh, basically the idea is that, you know, we have a JavaScript interpreter that's embedded inside of your server, right? And that interpreter right now is SpiderMonkey, okay? SpiderMonkey is like Mozilla's JavaScript interpreter. It's pretty good. Um, there's a better one out there. Called V8, right? 
uh, you know, analyzing da data that just comes in, right? And one of the one of the techniques that we like to use is called pre-aggregation, right? So you know, we like to pre-aggregate this stuff. So we have some operators that are pretty nice for that. So if I do something like this, let, let's say I have a totally different collection, okay? And let's call that um, clicks or something, okay? And see, db.clicks.com, now, now clicks doesn't even exist at all, right? I do db.clicks.find, there's nothing in there. So if I do db.clicks.updates, and let's say I want to update where um, mm -hmm. underscore ID, I'm going to give it a custom ID. I'm going to say URL is um, denver.js, <coughs> like a top level domain name. Yep, that would be cool if it was, but um, denver.js. Um, okay, so let's just say that that's, that's the URL we're tracking on. Okay, let's just pretend that's the case. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, I want to increment hits by one. Okay? So now that doesn't, that, that, and I want to say true. And true means I'm doing an upsert, right? So what happens when you're doing an upsert is that basically, you know, you got this stuff, right? I got my nice document right there. So that URL, you know, it's a unique field right there. And I can quit. So my code doesn't have to change it, right? I can keep it going and going and going and going and going and And uh, I find that I got my next spot. So your application code is really smooth like that, right? If you're doing something like this. Get a lot more complex, right? So um, well, let me let me just let me just give you a thing. So so that would that, that would be like a nice optimization, right? When we're actually writing out a separate document, you know, for each action that happens, you know, if I can just like find a really intelligent way to kind of pre-aggregate. So a lot of people use it for this, right? A lot of people build kind of in-house analytic systems, they build real-time analytic systems, you know, using this kind of model. And I don't have to think in advance about um, I don't have to do any like in so many round trips to figure out does this exist, if it exists, and you know, I think we did things. Yeah, kind of question on ID. Yeah. Um, is, it, is it like a common pattern to use like a hash, or like a unique hash as an ID as opposed to just like a standard? So the object ID thing? Yeah, it's not a common pattern, but you can use it to your advantage if you're, if you're kind of smart about what you do with it, right? Depending on the data. So by default, you know, you just use a on object ID. But like, what's really cool about this strategy is that you know what happens is the more indexes we create, the more each write is going to cost us, right? So if we want to build the most efficient system we can, then we want to utilize that default index um, as efficiently as we possibly can. Okay? So the reason I put that in there is, is to do just that. Right. Okay? So I want to show you um, this is from like a, a, an advanced schema design um, thing that I've done. And I want to show you kind of a cool way to you know, kind of blow this out and show you like what you can actually do um, in this case. So, uh, so I wanna... That was really good. <laughs> that was the fastest light you talked about. <laughs> Not even here. Let me just show you what I'm gonna do, okay? So let's say I want to build a really awesome real-time analytics system, okay? How am I gonna do that? Like I'm gonna have I'm gonna have a couple collections, okay? And I'm gonna scope my collections to days and months. Okay, does that make some kind of sense? Mm -hmm. So what I'm gonna do is this. I'm gonna have a collection, and we'll call it clicks like Feb like just uh, to February. Okay, does that make sense? And I'm gonna i I'm gonna insert documents in here in this way. So I have our underscore ID, right? And we can have our underscore ID, you know, same kind of thing, URL. And then what I'm going to do within each of these, um, each of these month, each of these, uh, this, this particular month object, is I'm going to increment a couple values, right? The first thing I'm going to increment is overall hits for the entire month, right? And the second thing I'm going to increment is an inner structure. So we're going to say something like, um, because we want the totals for a particular day of that month, too. So I can actually have, like, days dot uh, one, Before the first column, here's the next row. 